Good morning. morning. We welcome you to Peace Evangelical Lutheran Church for our Sunday worship on a day when we're celebrating Ascension. The actual day of Ascension would have been this past Thursday, but this is too important a festival to miss in the church here. So the order of worship that we have before you this morning is based on that Ascension message, and it can all be capsulized by the hymn writer who said, On Christ's Ascension, I now build the hope of my Ascension. We follow the order of worship. Those of you joining us by the live stream can find that at our website, peaceoten.org. And as you follow along, you see that our opening hymn is what I just mentioned, hymn 173, On Christ's Ascension, I Now Build. follow this morning is a simplified version of Matin's morning praise. As you find it in the worship folder, we now focus our attention on the call to worship. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall declare your praise. Hasten to save me, O God. O Lord, come greatly to help me. The Spirit of the Lord fills the world. Let us worship him. And we offer the triune God our worship and praise by singing verses 1 and 2 of hymn 169. Alleluia. Sing to Jesus. Please remain standing to sing this hymn. Yeah. 
day Intercessor, friend of sinners A Redeemer, hear our plea Where the songs of all the sinless Sweep across the crystal sea Please be seated for our first Bible readings. The heart and core of every one of our worship services is that word of God, that precious book in which the Lord God outlines for us his gracious plan of salvation. As we focus our attention on that word of God for this Ascension Day, first of all, we turn to a psalm that describes our glorious Lord. Please open your hymnals to page 85 in the front of the hymnal, Psalm 47, and we will join in this hymn of praise after we hear our accompanist introduce the song. scriptures where we can turn for a historical record of the ascension of Jesus Christ. Our first reading for this morning takes us to one of those locations. The gospel writer Luke also writes in Acts and he begins this history of the church with a record of Jesus' ascension. Acts chapter 1 beginning at verse 1. I wrote my first book Theophilus about everything began, Jesus began doing and teaching until the day he was taken up, after he had given instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After he had suffered, he presented himself alive to the apostles with many convincing proofs. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and told them things about the kingdom of God. Once, when he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for what the Father promised, which you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they were together with him, they asked, Lord, is this the time when you're going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he said these things, he was taken up while they were watching, 
and a cloud took him out of their sight. They were looking intently into the sky as he went away. Suddenly, two men in white clothes stood beside them. They said, Men of Galilee, why are you standing here looking up into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Here ends our first reading. Blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Amen. Our epistle reading echoes this message of Jesus' ascension, but in Ephesians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul doesn't repeat the historical record. Instead, he shows us the theological significance, the spiritual and personal significance of Jesus' ascension, the benefit for you and for me and all believers. We turn our attention to Ephesians 1. We begin reading at verse 16. I never stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep praying that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, will give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in knowing Christ fully. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, so that you may know the hope to which he has called you, just how rich his glorious inheritance among the saints is, and just how surpassingly great his power is for us who believe. It is as great as the working of his mighty strength, which God worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule, authority, power, and dominion, and above every name that is given, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. God also placed all things under his feet, and made him head over everything for the church. The church is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Here ends our epistle. And I pray we can't help but respond in praise again. This time, opening up our hymnals to hymn 175, we sing verses 1 through 4 of the hymn, Hail the Day That Sees Him Rise. Our Gospel for Ascension Day is taken from the book of Luke, the 24th chapter. We begin reading there with verse 44. He said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. He said to them, This is what is written, and so it must be. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Look, I'm sending you what my Father promised, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. He led them out as far as the vicinity of Bethany. He lifted up his hands and blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he parted from them and was taken up into heaven. So they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. They were continually in the temple courts, praising and blessing God. Amen. Here ends our gospel reading, and we respond with a simple prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful people, and kindle in us the fire of your love. Alleluia. We continue with our pre-sermon hymn, the hymn of the day, hymn 170, Draw Us to Thee, Please Be Seated. Oh, 
This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. How can we not have Christian joy when we pause and we celebrate ascension, when we see our Savior, all of his work completed and finished, restored to glory, back to the throne that, on where he sat from eternity itself, and now we know he's sitting there, watching over you and me ever so closely, that he even sees when we lose a hair in the comb, when we brush it, in the morning. We have a glorious Savior that's described also in the Old Testament. The basis for this Ascension Day service and ser uh, worship and, and sermon is Psalm 45. It has the heading in the EHV, the wedding of the victorious king. The psalmist writer begins, my heart is bubbling over with a beautiful theme. I am reciting my works for the king. My tongue is the pen of a rapid writer. You are the most beautiful of the sons of Adam. Grace is poured out on your lips. Therefore, God has blessed you forever. Strap your sword on your thigh, you mighty warrior, in your splendor and your majesty. In your majesty, advance successfully. Ride forward in the cause of truth, humility, and righteousness. Let your right hand teach you awesome deeds. Your arrows are sharpened. Let peoples fall beneath you. Your arrows are in the heart of the king's enemies. Your throne, O oh God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of justice. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of joy more than any of your companions. Myrrh, aloes, and cassia perform perfume all your garments. From ivory palaces, stringed instruments make you glad. Daughters of kings are among your honored attendants. The royal wife stands at your right hand in gold from Ophir. Hear, O daughter, look and listen. Forget your people in your father's house because the king desires your beauty, because he is your Lord, bow down to him. Then the daughter of Tyre will come with a gift. The richest people will seek your favor. The princess who waits inside is all glorious. Her dress is interwoven with gold. In embroidered garments, she is led to the king. Virgins who follow her as attendants are brought to you. They are brought with joyful celebration. They enter the palace of the king. Your sons will take the place of your fathers. You will make them princes in all the earth. I will preserve the memory of your name through all generations. Therefore, peoples will praise you forever and ever. This is the word of our God. I pray he blesses our study of this message this morning.
And the words we just heard describe a great and glorious king. According to the rest of scripture, they clearly refer to Jesus, the bridegroom, the church is his bride. So we hear the message and our spirit is lifted at least for a moment. And then in 45 minutes or so, we leave those doors and we go back out into the world. And wave after wave, it's going to hit us. Wave after wave. First, Maybe we do something as simple as check our smartphones for the narrative, for the, for the news of the day, or maybe, you know, we're, we're kind of uh, glued all too often to a screen, and now it's real handy because you got the streaming services of Amazon Prime, Netflix, just about everybody has that. And I don't know if you're anything like me, at times you go, I can't believe they're showing that on television that is supposed to be for families. I, I doubt that I'm the only one that at times goes, I can't believe that was just a, a, an ad, a commercial. And that was the message of that commercial. The seamy, seedy underbelly of our society. It's, it's like it's just all bubbled right to the top. Maybe under the cover of that 800 pound gorilla I've talked about too much, the, the worldwide pandemic. It just, I can't be the only one who's shocked. And it can't be the only one who weeps. Who weeps? What else is there to do when there's another school shooting? 19 children, do I have that detail correct? Two adults of Aldi, Texas, gunned down in school. That's supposed to be a safe place in our society. That's supposed to be where another generation of our precious children is nurtured to grow up and become the next generation of good citizens in the United States. And I got to tell you, there are times, there are times when I think about my now all too close retirement and I say to myself, Glenn, you don't need cable or the internet in any form once you retire. Completely cut the cord. There's none of it you want to hear anyway. There's none of it you want to, you want to even listen to. My smartphone? I am so tempted to take it on the first day of retirement and pitch it into Boot Lake. That way it'll be peaceful, it'll be quiet. I'll be able to completely sequester myself in the work of finishing a tar paper shack and going fishing and visit family once in a while and just cloister myself from a world that seems to be spinning out of control. And then my Heavenly Father speaks to me again, as he speaks to all of us in the pages of his precious word. And he basically says, Glenn, get a grip. This world might feel as if it's spinning out of control, but that does not fit the facts. I see the entire picture as a one grand and glorious tapestry. I see how it's all being woven together as it's going to culminate on that last day, the day of judgment, my son has already been enthroned in heaven above. He's watching over you even now this very minute. Our world is not in control. And that's the message that we also get from Psalm 45 that we study for a few moments this morning. The inspired writer just states it as a fact. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Period. No matter what it might like seem like at times to you and me. The throne upon which Jesus has already ascended, that's the Ascension Day message, loud and clear. And the rest of the Ascension Day message, I hope it's every bit as loud and clear. This is the throne that Jesus shares with his bride, the church, and that means you and me. There's a lot of rich, vivid imagery in this psalm. I pray this sermon doesn't muck it up and in any way blur that imagery. Read the psalm when you have a little bit of time to get home. It, it, it's describing the psalmist who feels so privileged. He gets to write a song for this event, a royal event and a royal wedding. And step by step by step, he's going to describe first the bridegroom in great detail. Grand and glorious, not wearing a tux, but basically dressed up 
to be able to go right from the wedding into battle, into war again, on behalf of the bride. That's also described so completely and beautifully in this psalm. And it's all because of the children. Also described here. That's you and me. That's Psalm 45. That's the sound bite. Let's make sure the rest of this message doesn't blur that or muck it up. The psalmist is so honored that he explains, my heart is bubbling over with a beautiful theme. I am reciting my works for the king. My tongue is the pen of a rapid writer. He can't get it down on the page fast enough. So excited he is. So uh, overwhelmed he is at the grand and glory, grand glory of this royal wedding. And it, make no mistake, it's a king that's getting married. But which king? Well, I guess I already gave that away. So let's just move forward. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is the scepter of justice. You and I need to remember that when we listen to the narrative, the news that just grinds on us every day, at least me. I, I, in fact, I, I step away and I filter that and I only listen to it um, in little sound bites because I always think it's important for a pastor to at least know what's going on in the world and the community. But then it come back into scripture, come back into scripture and see this king that is described here and elsewhere in the Bible. The older I get, not old, the older I get, the more I enjoy seeing how the scriptures just so beautifully locks together, woven together, Old Testament with new. I can't read Psalm 45 without thinking of another description of our grand and glorious ascended Savior Jesus Christ, an extended description that you find in Revelation, last book of the Bible where we see Jesus seated on the throne of heaven above. And there are flashes of lightning, rumblings, and crashes of thunder. In front of our Savior's majestic throne is this glass sea, which was like crystal. If you like to go boating, once in a while, if the sun isn't too hot, you and I know what it is like when there's not a ripple on the water. How serene and comfortable that is. And around his throne are angels. Day and night, we're told, also according to the prophet Isaiah, who got a glimpse of Jesus in, in heaven above, there are these angels who are shouting, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is coming. And the best part of all these pictures of our ascended Savior in heaven above is this, that he's also surrounded by our Christian brothers and sisters in the faith who've gone on ahead into heaven above. They've already passed away, but they are forever safe. And the pictures here remind us that they're also joining in this eternal, rousing, thundering hymn of praise to God. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive the glory and the honor and the power. For you have created all things, and because of your will, they existed and were created. Revelation chapter 4. Selected verses. Now we come back to the sun. And this particular wedding seems a little bit different. Uh, uh, the wedding, the royal wedding that takes place. And then the groom is encouraged immediately to strap your sword on your thigh, you mighty warrior. In your splendor, in your majesty, in your majesty advance successfully. Ride forward in the cause of truth, humility, and righteousness. Let your right hand teach your awesome deeds. Your arrows are sharpened. Let peoples fall beneath you. Your arrows are in the heart of the king's enemies. I emphasize that because it states a fact. This groom, this king, he's already won the fight. It's over. It's just that his enemies haven't quite figured that out yet. This is describing Jesus, our invincible warrior. The warrior that came to our earth about 2,000 years ago. But he didn't look the part. He didn't carry a sword then. He didn't wear armor. He didn't ride a white steed. Oh, there was that occasion when he 
came into Jerusalem on the donkey's back. And his angelic armies, they're always at his beck and call, always ready to, to go around this world wherever they're needed, but they stayed off on the side. They weren't seen, for the most part, during Jesus' public ministry, except for a few key moments. And yet make no mistake, when Jesus came to our earth, he came to fight. And he came to die. But instead of taking up a sword in hand, he fought with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. He showed his power over the devil himself by casting out demons with a mere command. At times even doing that, when the mighty apostles tried and tried and tried, they couldn't perform an exorcism, but Jesus could just with a command. And with the command, he showed his power over wind and wave, sickness, even death. And he came to fight, never forget that. But he came to fight for you and me according to God's eternal plan of salvation. So he fought first by living a perfect, blameless life. Nobody, even though they tried desperately at the end, they, they struggled to even bring up false charges against Jesus. His, his reputation was so clean and clear. Had to be that way because he's the perfect son of God. And yet that perfect son of God hung on a cross and fought. I guess usually we call this Jesus passive obedience. Because he didn't summon his almighty power and cause that hill of Golgotha to just kind of disappear into the ground. All the Roman soldiers and all the Jewish leaders, he could have done that with a mere thought. He could have come down from that cross when they were egging him on and taunting him. And yet he didn't because love riveted him to that cross for you and for me. So make no mistake, the first time Jesus came to our earth, he was a warrior and he was a warrior who won. But now maybe as believers, then we get a little confused. What in the world's going on? Why is there so, still so much crime and violence and hate and sin, mass shootings, child molestation? Why is our society so seedy and so, so seamy? So we join the psalmist, first of all, in urging Jesus, our Savior, to ride forth again in the cause of truth, humility, and righteousness. We echo the psalmist's prayer, as do all battle-weary, beleaguered believers around the world. But with so much evil in this world, how can it possibly be true that Jesus will win? Uh, that statement wasn't quite theologically correct. And hopefully you'll all call me on that. Those of you joining by the live stream too say, ah, senior moment, you said something a little wrong there. How is it possible that Jesus will win? <laughs> it's not what the Bible says. The victory is accomplished. It was finished when Jesus shouted to Telestai from the cross. The battle was over. We just have insurgencies all around the world of terrorist groups pushed forward by Satan who's just kind of thrashing around and he doesn't want to admit defeat yet. The battle has been won. The final battle's victory is guaranteed even though all of the world together stand together at once. And those are some of the pictures we have of the very last days before the judgment day. As if all the world stands together as one, united in evil, under the devil, we're going to make one last charge against Jesus on the throne, and we're going to topple him. We're going to win. We're going to pull this one out at the end of the fourth quarter. No. Can't possibly happen. Psalm 2, add that to your suggested home reading. Even this last massive attack, the Lord is sitting on his throne, the one who is seated in heaven will laugh. God the Father will announce simply, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. Psalm 2 verse 6, that's Jesus. Nothing, no one is going to topple Jesus from his throne. Not even the limitless wickedness of the end times. And so you and I, need to look away from our world. 
we need to set aside the narrative in the news. And we need to get back into the scriptures because the best part of Ascension Day is this, that our Savior sits on the throne and that's a throne that he shares with the bride, the church. Read Psalm 45 when you get home. It, it'll be well worth your time. The detailed, vivid imagery of a royal wedding in the time of the psalmist. I suppose the closest we can come to envisioning this in the modern era is we check out some of the YouTube videos for what sometimes happens over in England and countries like that. But here, verses 10 and 11, describe this marriage. And this is where we're told, Hear, O daughter, look and listen. Forget your people in your father's house because the king desires your beauty. Because he is your Lord, bow down to him. Think about that for a moment. Let me, let me reread it, uh, especially this phrase, Hero, daughter, look and listen. Forget your people and your father's house because the king desires your beauty. What does that almost sound like? I think we have a figure of speech for that. Cold feet. Cold feet. It, it happens once in a great while. It happens with the weddings that I perform. It's sometimes just because either bride or groom or both, they're just so overwhelmed with all the emotions of the moment. Uh, the, the, the implications, but we're doing this now, we're announcing our commitment to one another uh, in sickness and in health, good times, bad times, wealth, poverty, till death us do part. And that the enormity of all that can cause somebody to have cold feet. I know of brides back in the usual dressing room in this chapel, back in the, in the back room, mm -hmm. that at the last minute are, okay, we need to reset, and, and, and we'll start this wedding when we start this wedding. And over the years, I've often joked, I, I think the way this building was structured is brilliant, because usually the groom and the groomsmen all need to go back with the pastor into this little sacristy before the wedding starts, and there's no <coughs> other exit. There's no other exit. You guys were ingenious when you decided that that way. Except you didn't count on a pastor being quite this rotund. So sometimes if it's a big group, we, we kind of got to, you know, let's look our best for the service, guys. Cold feet. Why in the world would the bride of Christ ever get cold feet at the thought of being united with our Lord through eternity itself in heaven above? Why do we need to hear Forget your people in your father's house. Who wouldn't want to forget this world and all of its pain and all of its sorrow? Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You mean to tell me that when I leave this earth, I have to leave my tar paper shack in Eagle River, Wisconsin? You mean to tell me that there won't be any more boat rides on Boot Lake with my mighty toon pontoon boat? You mean to tell me I'm not going to have time to restore my 1970 Aaron's Arrow snowmobile with that twin cylinder, 24 horsepower Kohler engine? You mean to tell me that I won't have the same relationships that I have here and now? Uh, first with family, wife, daughter, moving forward, a, a, a church family left behind here, but another church family gained a Trinity Manaqua. You mean to tell me I got to leave behind my 403B retirement account just when maybe there's a little hope on the horizon, perhaps it'll re regain some of its uh, value? There can be so many things that tie us to the here and now. And here's the psalmist basically saying, let it all go. Let it all go, Christian friends. There's something so much greater and glorious in heaven above. Rejoice in that day when the ascended Savior will come back to this earth. Rejoice in the fact that in the meantime, you and I still have a mission. You and I still have a purpose in this life. It's to pass the good news of Jesus on to the next generations so that your sons will take the place of your fathers. You will make them princes in all the land. We don't have to get all shook up by the daily headlines trumpeting evil and violence in our world. We don't have to get weighed down by the seamy, seedy underbelly of our society because we have Jesus. 
seated on the throne and watching over us even now. One last encouragement, read Psalm 45 when you have a chance. And rejoice that on Christ's ascension, we now build the hope of our ascension. Amen. The peace of God that passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. This brings us to a pivot point in our worship services. We've heard the word of God. We've heard that word explained a little bit in the sermon. And now what we do is meant to be a response of thanks to the Lord God who's given us everything through his son, Jesus Christ. Part of that response is the free will offering. For those in the chapel, the offering is taken by a basket in the back. For those of you joining us by the live stream, that offering is taken online, if you so desire. There's that button right on our homepage. Many of you are using that. Many of you have scheduled automatic gifts using that online option. Others of you are still using what I often call snail mail, regular mail, and you're sending your offerings in that way. We pray that every penny received is used faithfully to get out the most important message this earth can hear. It's the message of God and his grace in Jesus. Another way in which we show our thanks to the Lord is taking him up on his invitation, his offer, to come to him in prayer. We'll do that now using the prayers that are printed in the worship folder. Please stand. And we join, first of all, in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lord Jesus, King of glory, on this day you ascended far above the heavens, and at God's right hand you rule the nations. Leave us not alone, we pray, but grant us the spirit of truth, that at your command and by your power we may be your witnesses in all the world. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us safely to this new day. Defend us with your mighty power and grant that this day we neither fall into sin nor run into any kind of danger. And in all we do, direct us to what is right in your sight through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Let us praise the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you all. Amen. We close with the singing of another hymn of praise to our ascended Savior, 370, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name, verses 4 and 5. Please be seated.
Again, welcome to Peace Evangelical Lutheran Church for our Ascension Day celebration. And thank you for the privilege of being able again to worship with you and lead you in worship. A week ago, I believe I admitted to you after the service and announcements that with all the help I had moving, I got tired just watching other people doing all the heavy lifting and the work of moving. A week later, I guess old people can also get a rebound in energy by the news that we re all received this past week. Uh, hopefully by now you're aware of the fact that the Lord of the Church, the Holy Spirit, guided the assignment committee to assign a candidate, and that's the technical term until he's ordained and installed. That might confuse you, but candidate Thomas Welch of Appleton, Wisconsin, to be assigned as the next pastor at Peace Evangelical Lutheran Church. And then if you watch the live stream, even our synodical president maybe stumbled a smidgen when he said, Michigan Technological University. I've teased them after the fact that I didn't know Michigan Technological University had become a calling body in the Synod, but that's just because your pastor's kind of silly that way. We know that he'll be sharing his duties here with peace in the campus ministry. Uh, I don't know how many of you have already talked to candidate Welch. If you look at our newsletter, there's a brief bio and update on him, including his letter of acceptance that I want to read now, and I should get to it rather than going on and on and on. But I had a long discussion with him yesterday, and it was really exciting to see his commitment to getting to the area. He and his wife, Grace, wanting to get to know you. Uh, he said, and I quote, we both love winter. <laughs> and I thought, oh, you don't even know. <laughs> you don't even know. But I didn't say that, except now that's on the live stream. Uh, more important, the guy loves to ice fish. I mean, what more needs to be said? The, the Holy Spirit, the way that he's woven all this together, uh, he's a son of Mount Olive Congregation in Appleton, Wisconsin. Some of you might go, Mount Olive, Mount Olive. Oh, that's where another graduate candidate way back in the day, Pastor Rob Roche, when he left the ministry here, he went and he's still at Mount Olive in Appleton. And so now he can also help in the mentoring of candidate Thomas Welch. Finally, we get to his letter to the congregation. Dear members of Peace Lutheran Church, on May 26th, I received the solemn call that you have extended to me through the assignment committee. With this letter, I wish to announce my acceptance of this call. Looking to the Lord who has called me for strength and wisdom through his word, I look forward with joy to serving Peace Lutheran Church. Installation plans will be made in consultation with Steve Krug and your leadership team. I would like to suggest August 6th as the tentative Sunday for the ordination and installation service if this date is agreeable to you and if moving arrangements can be made on schedule. May our mutual prayer be that the Lord bring my wife Grace, sons Roland and Linus, and daughter Trudy safely into your midst and bless our labors together in his vineyard. In his service with you, Thomas Welch, I'd ask that we bow our heads right now and have a brief prayer as requested. Lord God, Holy Spirit, Lord of the Church, we praise you for guiding the call process as you have. We praise you for providing another pastor for the important ministry of Peace Evangelical Lutheran Church and also for that important ministry of campus ministry where you help us nurture another generation of leaders in the Wisconsin Synod. Bless candidate Welch, his wife Grace, and his family as they now go through that big job of packing up and getting ready to get on the road. Send your holy angels to guard and keep them during their travels and bless them as they settle into the copper country for what we pray will be a ministry that is a rich blessing for them and everyone they serve. We ask this in the name of Jesus, the Ascended Savior. Amen. So you get a pastor from the seminary out with the old, in with the young, so in with the new. And, and I missed, missed up the statement a little bit, which is proofs. One more sign. It's time. We'll surf off into the sunset. I might, have, I might be writing something about that in a Forward in Christ article, and maybe it'll be in August if you approve the article. Okay. Uh, that, brings, <laughs> that brings an end to the live stream with the prayer we've been using for a long time now. God sent his holy angels to guard and keep you and protect all of our homes and all of our families. And even more important, may God's spirit continue to work in your heart and mind to plant that flag of faith in Jesus and to strengthen that flag of faith as only he can using God's precious word and sacrament. That ends our live stream. God's richest blessings.